Okay, um, so in today's class, I'm going to start a new chapter, and uh, that is the uh, topic of uh, Matsubara Green's functions and uh, its non-equilibrium version, uh, which uh, goes by various names such as Keldish formalism and so on and so forth. So, um, if you remember that I had already explained to you what a Green's function is in the context of many particle systems. It is uh, all about uh, the overlap of two wave functions. One is, uh, suppose you want to talk about the whole, there are two types of Green's function. One is the whole Green's function, the other is particle Green's function. In the case of whole Green's function, you start with some given state which contains some n number of particles and you remove a particle at a given time, at a given position and then you let the state evolve you let the system evolve naturally and then after a while you reinsert uh, that particle that you had removed uh, at some other point at some other time and then you ask yourself what is the overlap the quantum mechanical overlap between the new state that you obtain immediately after reinserting the particle and the starting state so that's called the whole greens function so you could do a particle Green's function as well where you uh, start with n number of particles and but then you insert a particle rather than remove it. So you insert a particle from, uh, from outside and then you, again you let the system evolve naturally and then you remove that extra particle that you have uh, inserted. So that would be the particle Green's function. So now it so happens that uh, if the system that, uh, so you see uh, till now we had not discussed uh, anything involving temperature. So remember that uh, in, in nature no system is truly isolated. So that means any system that you are considering, you know a quantum mechanical system is typically you know a solid, a piece of solid or you know or just uh, you know electrons in a solid for example i mean you, whatever system that you are trying to study and none of those uh, entities are truly isolated they are always coupled to some surroundings and those surroundings necessarily influence the system that you are studying and that too in a very non subtle way it influences it in, in a very drastic way so one of the usual uh, types of uh, coupling to the environment that we are very familiar with is the situation where the system in question exchanges energy with its surroundings freely and comes to a thermal equilibrium. That means there is something common between the system that you are considering and the surroundings and that common quantity is called the temperature, the absolute temperature of both the systems and the surroundings. They are both equal. So that is precisely the situation that I want to study right now where I have a quantum mechanical system uh, consisting of uh, many particles be, be they bosons or fermions and I want to study how they behave when uh, you allow them to exchange energy with their surroundings and come to an equilibrium with some uh, common temperature with the surroundings. So having uh, achieved that equilibrium, now you can ask the same questions that you would uh, ask uh, when the system was isolated. Namely, you can ask the same question, suppose I remove an electron in such a system which has come to an equilibrium with its surroundings and then I wait for a while and reinsert uh, the particle back into the system. You see what is the quantum mechanical overlap? Now uh, you see uh, that overlap is going to be, uh, is again going to involve uh, summing over states but then you have to make sure that you uh, associate a, a Boltzmann weight with respect to each state. So that means you see that is the idea of uh, canonical statistical mechanics that uh, so if you remember that when I was discussing this idea of a whole Green's function, I kind of uh, uh, alluded to the fact that uh, the system uh, under consideration was in an eigenstate of some Hamiltonian with some eigenvalue 
and then the evolution would then be unitary with uh, precisely that particular energy. But however, when the system is exchanging energy with surroundings, that is no longer the case. See, it does not have a well defined energy. So, it is going to be in a superposition of states with different energies. But now that superposition now comes with a weight and that is the Boltzmann weight and, so, and you all know what I am talking about and uh, that is basically this. So, this is called the Boltzmann weight. So, that means you see uh, in, in any, uh, I am just refreshing your memory of stat canonical statistical mechanics. Uh, by the way, that is supposed to be prerequisite for this course. Unfortunately, this is an advanced course and many topics are considered prerequisites. So, you see uh, when you do a average in canonical statistical mechanics, what you actually mean is that you are summing over all possible uh, eigenstates. But then it is uh, each eigenstate comes with a, I mean not all, all energies are equally probable. Okay. So, uh, so it is it's not just this, this is what I am, this is, these two would be the same if the system was in, in a well defined eigenstate like n and that n is, uh, so that means uh, if it is in an eigenstate of n, it also has a well defined energy called E n, but that is not possible when the system is exchanging energy with surroundings. So, there is, so in other words, there is a probability for that system to be in that eigenstate and that probability is basically proportional to E raised to E n by k t according to Boltzmann. Okay. So, now uh, this is what I mean by canonical uh, statmic averaging that means, so in canonical statistical mechanics the average of any operator is given by this. Okay. So, now uh, you see uh, this is what we are going to be doing. Uh, so, when I speak of overlap, so when I speak of time evolution and finding averages, I usually, uh, I mean I am going to mean in this chapter average of this kind. So, where I do a quantum statistical averaging, that means it is uh, it's not averaging over eigenstates, but averaging over all possible eigenstates, but each eigenstate comes with a certain weight and that weight is uh, dependent on the absolute temperature. Okay, uh, so, let us uh, let us see how that is practically done. Okay. But in order for me to do this, I will have to uh, go through uh, some formalism okay. and uh, that is basically it will lead us to the Matsubara Green's function. So, Matsubara is the name of a Japanese physicist who uh, uh, studied the idea of finite temperature Green's functions quite extensively. So, you see uh, the idea is that uh, you want to be able to write down you see uh, remember that I had a uh, I had defined to you what it means to evolve the creation operator or the annihilation operator with respect to time. So, if it uh, you see if I had this sort of uh, time evolution normally in the case of operators that conserve the number of particles this is very straightforward it would simply be uh, given by e raised to i t h by h bar c r 0 e raised to minus i t h by h bar. I mean there is nothing great about this, but then you see uh, here in this particular uh, case where c uh, does not conserve the number of particles. So, I have to reinterpret this h properly because now uh, this h refers to uh, systems with a different number of particles. So, now a c of r comma t would then become c of h n minus 1 by h bar c of r 0 e raised to uh, minus r t h n by 
So, you see you have to act this on a state containing n number of particles, then you annihilate a particle. So, the first you evolve that state uh, from time t equal to 0 to time t equal to t uh, using the Hamiltonian containing the original number of particles which is n and then you annihilate a particle and then you reduce once you annihilate a particle you reduce the number of particles from n to n minus 1. Having done that now whatever operator you act on subsequently is necessarily going to be an operator that is consistent with the new uh, number of particles that is the new uh, reduced number of particles is now n minus 1 earlier it was n because I have annihilated it is n minus 1. So, this is the only caveat you have to keep in mind ok, otherwise it would be the same, it is just that you are you have reduced the number of particles by 1. So, I want to make practical progress in evaluating these Green's functions. So, to do that I first realize that there will be uh, in most situations of interest the Hamiltonian is not going to be exactly diagonalizable. In other words, I will not know the uh, exact eigenstates and exact eigenvalues. So, if I do a, uh, I mean practically you know in principle of course, we can always assume that you, you can give it some names and proceed. You can say eigen let the eigenvalues be E n and we can proceed that way. But practically speaking, it is not possible to know those eigenstates and eigenvalues exactly. So, this particular uh, technique actually enables you to not only define uh, the Green's functions at finite temperature, it also allows you to uh, develop a systematic perturbative technique to uh, explicitly evaluate those Green's functions in situations where your Hamiltonian is not exactly diagonalizable. So, in order to achieve this uh, what we are going to do is we are going to first uh, start with this uh, assumption that this Hamiltonian even though it is not exactly diagonalizable we can always split it up into two parts. One part is exactly diagonalizable which is called H0 and the other part is not. So, that is called a perturbation. So, perturbation uh, does not mean necessarily it is small. I mean the English word perturbation suggests uh, you know a small disturbance, but uh, that smallness is not uh, a priori obvious that uh, we, we simply separate out a Hamiltonian to two parts, one part we know how to handle, the other part we do not know and we optimistically call that other part perturbation. But whether it deserves that name or not now is determined by subsequent calculations. So, we have to then go ahead and uh, perform certain calculations uh, estimate its effect, the estimate the effect of the term that we have called perturbation and see if that indeed uh, qualifies uh, to be called that ok. So, uh, so that is the reason why uh, it is very important that we develop a technique which enables us to estimate the effects of this uh, extra term that we are having difficulty in handling ok. So, how do we do that? So, first of all uh, I am going to define an operator uh, which resembles an evolution operator which is called this ok. So, now clearly if H, H0 and V commute then it would not be interesting because then H0 plus V would also be diagonalizable in some sense. So, uh, the interesting situations uh, will be when H0 and V do not commute that is the typical situation where H0 plus V uh, the eigenstates and eigenvalues of H0 plus V cannot be determined easily ok. So, in that case we may still be able to write this uh, u of s in the following way. So, I am going to write uh, u of s as e raised to s h 0 times uh, some other unitary operator. Well, some other at this stage s is can be complex. So, I do not know what it is, but later on we will make s imaginary and it becomes unitary. But whatever it is uh, there should be an s 
capital S operator which depends on this parameter small s and so the capital S uh, is uh, trivially equal to this. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to be able to, so this is a little bit of, I mean this is not particularly useful to write it this way, I mean it is not very instructive because uh, you see uh, there is a V in the exponent and it is supposed to be perturbative, it means supposed to be a perturbation. So what I uh, anticipate is that this s which is a function of this parameter small s should uh, be expressible as a series in powers of this perturbation because it is only then that uh, this sort of a method has some practical utility. So if you very formally symbolically write it this way, it is a trivial tautology, it is by definition this, but then it is not particularly useful to write it like this. So the question is how would you uh, now make sense out of this uh, S operator uh, as uh, how would you write S of S in powers of this uh, uh, term that we have optimistically called a perturbation. So the way to do that is you first uh, differentiate uh, S with respect to S. So when you do that uh, after you perform a series of algebraic uh, maneuvers you will end up with uh, this expression. So this expression basically tells you that you can always uh, rewrite the uh, rate of change of S with respect to S as uh, a differential equation where the differential equation is basically involves a prefactor which is also a function of s. Okay. So the idea is that you see uh, s of 0 is clearly what? So if you s if by definition if you put s is equal to 0, the small s is equal to 0, s of 0 is going to be 1 uh, by definition. So that means we should be able to iterate this. So the idea is that you know if, if I just uh, solve this integral equation s of s, so what is this going to be? This is going to be something like uh, 1 plus integral s, so v tau s of tau d tau. So this is an exact uh, integral form of this uh, taking into account the initial value also. So the initial value says if you put small s equals 0 it is 1 and if I take d by ds on both sides I get back this. Now all I do is I keep iterating this, I, I assume that initially uh, the approximate answer is 1. So then I substitute this back, the next approximate answer would be, so you just iterate 1 plus uh, S0 uh, d tau plus etc. etc. So now uh, this, uh, so this is the series that you will get if you iterate. Okay. So if you iterate, you will get this series, and uh, this this series is symbolically written like this. Okay. So this is called a time ordering symbol. Okay. So the time ordering symbol means that what it says is that basically you uh, first uh, pretend that you can go ahead and expand this exponential in powers of this v hat. So that means you just expand the exponential, you will get all kinds of factorial 1 by n factorial will appear in the denominator, but then notice that that is prominently absent here. So there is no 1 by n factorial in the exact answer when you iterate this uh, integral equation. But then inside this exponential, if you expand the exponential, there is going to be 1 by n factorial. So the idea of this time ordering is that it kind of, uh, it forces the, uh, so basically what, what time ordering means formally is that if you have a, a t b t dash, okay. so it basically, uh, it is same as a t b t dash if uh, if uh, t is greater than t dash and it is equal to b t dash a t if uh, uh, t dash is greater than t. So that is what time ordering means in this context. Okay. So the idea is that uh, 
so if you use this definition you can actually I mean so so this makes perfect sense you can convince yourself that so this you see this sort of resembles uh, uh, the expansion of an exponential so what is missing is basically uh, firstly it is exactly uh, it is not exactly that because you see in if it were truly expansion in exponent then uh, all the uh, upper limits should be s but in this case it is not s. So, the it goes from 0 to t dash then there is an it is an there is some nesting here it is not all s. So, that is one difference the other difference is the n factorial is missing. So, you will see that you can actually uh, represent this uh, summation where the upper limits are all nested in this way and n factorial is missing by pretending it is first an exponential and then you insert this uh, time ordering symbol. Okay, so, uh, so the point is that I mean it, it makes uh, the time ordering symbol is very convenient because it prevents you from uh, dragging this uh, series all over the place all the time. So, that means it is it's like an enormous uh, baggage that you have to keep dragging all over the place. So, when you do calculations you are typically have this this is called by the way it is called S matrix. Firstly, it is an operator. So, it is uh, every operator is thought can be thought of as a matrix. So, it is called the S matrix. So, this S matrix uh, is uh, by definition this series, but then uh, you know lugging this series around all the time is not convenient. So, it is nice to represent this in terms of some compact expression like this. So, if you express it in terms of something more compact like this, then you can uh, carry this along. Uh, everywhere without uh, much trouble. So, that is the reason why we write it in this compact way. Okay. So, that gives you an introduction a flavor to something called the S matrix. So, now let us go ahead and see uh, how the S matrix uh, looks like if the perturbation in question is uh, something that uh, we know exists, but we have been scared of uh, dealing with till now and uh, that perturbation is basically the interaction between particles. So, remember that uh, till now we had not given too much importance to uh, this important concept uh, I mean well it is likely to be important because you see after all electrons are charged particles and you know that uh, electromagnetic force is long ranged. So, there is every reason to believe that uh, it is a bad idea to ignore the inter interaction between uh, electrically charged uh, particles like uh, electrons, but because of the difficulty in handling that till now we have been conveniently ignoring that. But now the question is uh, we are now that we have we seem to have a handle on this S matrix we should be able to we should not hesitate in introducing this. Uh, as a perturbation and and uh, see if it leads us to some something interesting okay so now uh, let me get back to this original uh, issue namely you see if uh, if i have this time evolution of the annihilation operator so remember that if you write h also in the second quantized uh, representation second quantized form it is not necessary to constantly remind yourself that there are the n particles the n minus the, so this thing already keeps track of that. So, that is the reason why I have not put a subscript n n minus 1 and all that. So, so it leads you to familiar territory. So, this is that familiar way of defining uh, time evolution of operators in the Heisenberg picture. So, now the question is see the point is that uh, because I uh, remember that I was able to write. So, this is what I wanted to write in terms of the S matrix. So, you see so this this has some. So, if I choose S as uh, I t by h bar this is my uh, you know inverse of the evolution operator as it were. So, that uh, has this form in terms of the S matrix. So, now I want to be able to write this and this in terms of the S matrix. Okay. So, now question is how would you do that? So, the first of all you write down the time evolution of the S matrix. 
Okay, so first of all you write it uh, in this way and also I am going to assume that I, I introduce some sources. So, for reasons I will tell you later, it is not part of this Hamiltonian, but uh, the effective Hamiltonian is going to be this plus this source. Okay. So, I am going to assume that it has an one more term which I did not uh, initially tell you. Okay, so, there is this, this term also part of the, so the, there was this H. So, what does H consists of? H consists of something I can very easily manage just the kinetic energy of fermions which is already diagonal, but also it includes something very nasty which is the Coulomb interaction between uh, fermions. So, that is what makes this problem very hard. But then there is also another term which is basically the source term, so which is something like a you know maybe an uh, electric field applied at some point. So, or, or basically this is some electric potential. So, that gives you some uh, extra energy because of that. But this is going to be necessary because later on is it is also used as a mathematical device. The, so, later on I will be able to differentiate with respect to W and obtain some interesting results. So, even though later on maybe W can actually be set to 0 if there is no such field involved. Just for the purposes of being able to uh, do some clever mathematical manipulation, I am entitled to introduce this W and later on get rid of it if indeed uh, there is no such external field. So, now the question is suppose there is such an external field then clearly I should be able to write down the evolution of my unitary operator in this way. Okay. So, now this unitary operator from my S matrix idea is uh, clearly this and this is my S, S matrix. Okay. So, um, okay, at, at this stage this S matrix is only with respect to W because I have, I have introduced I have not split this H into uh, H 0 and V yet. So, this H includes the H H0 and it in includes uh, this is H0 and this is V, it includes both. So, at this stage I have not split it up, but you will see why I have not split it up at this stage because I am going to do something very clever. So, this S matrix is with respect to uh, it is like it is as if I am treating this external source as a perturbation. Okay. So, the point is that well this is it is clearly unitary I mean I am making a big fuss out of something very simple. So, U and S are clearly unitary. So, so the point is that the time evolution of the annihilation operator is uh, now going to be expressible in terms of uh, the time evolution without the source. So, this is without the source. So, the source is W and this is uh, this is the S matrix of the source of the source. So, you have two things. So, now I am going to convince you that uh, the appropriate way of defining uh, Green's function of this system. So, what is the system? You have a system of fermions with kinetic energy, with mutual Coulomb interactions and coupled to an external source called W. So, if that is the case, then uh, the Green's function of this system, so there is, uh, okay, so I am, I am jumping many steps here. Okay, so, I think this is not the logical way of doing this. So, let me, uh, let me some spend time explaining this. So, it is kind of uh, very abrupt. So, so, let me explain why I did this. So, the idea is that I want to be able to define something called the whole Green's function and the particle Green's function. Okay. So, in order to do that, uh, I have to make sense out of this sort of an average. But remember what I told you about uh, averages uh, when the system is in uh, contact with an external surroundings where, where it is exchanging energy with that surroundings. So, in that case it, this is not going to be the simple averaging that you are normally familiar with. It is going to involve 
you know multiplying by the Boltzmann weight and uh, summing over all the eigenstates. But then uh, there is uh, another issue here that uh, which also something I should have um, mentioned earlier. So, see in addition to exchanging energy with surroundings, you can also have a, a situation where particles uh, can actually come in, in and out of the system. So, you might be thinking is not that an unusual occurrence, uh, that may very well be, but uh, you see what happens in many cases that uh, we usually uh, use this grand canonical ensemble approach. Uh, as a convenient way of studying uh, statistical mechanical systems even when the, the number of particles is uh, fixed. See usually it is the energy of the system is anyway usually not fixed. So, that is the reason why most of the time the system that you consider is of the canonical variety. Remember the three types of ensembles, the, there is the micro canonical ensemble where the energy of the system is fixed the number of particles is fixed, volume is fixed. So, that is the micro canonical ensemble and that is very rarely encountered in a practice because in practice the system that you are considering usually exchanges energy with surroundings, but then a number of particles can still be fixed. But what happens is that you see the reason why we study uh, grand canonical ensemble is that if you allow for the possibility that uh, the number of particles can also fluctuate and then there is it can exchange in, uh, particles with the surroundings and energy also with the surroundings and then come to an equilibrium, then you see not only is the temperature of the system and surroundings the same, there is something else that becomes the same between the system and the surrounding and that is called the chemical potential. And you might be wondering why, why am I allowing the number of particles in the system to fluctuate, is not that very unusual. So, firstly uh, it uh, need not be unusual for example, in some situations you will find that the system that you are uh, actually interested in is, uh, is part of a larger system and there is that, uh, that boundary between the system that you are considering and the surroundings may actually be an imaginary one, the one that you have imagined to be, a, there may be no actual physical boundary at all that you have decided that you have arbitrarily in your mind drawn some boundary and said this is my system and that is my surroundings. So, in which case clearly uh, there is going to be exchange of both particles and energy. So, the second reason is that even if you assume that there is a physical boundary that prevents uh, particles from entering or exiting, uh, it is still convenient to first study a situation where you allow particles to get exchanged with the surroundings and come to an equilibrium because you see in the thermodynamic limit the problem of studying uh, a system with fixed number of particles is uh, made simpler by studying the uh, grand canonical uh, version. That means, you first study a system where not only energy, but the number of particles also fluctuates. So, that actually is mathematically much simpler and when you study that the results that you get are in fact, uh, in the thermodynamic limit are equivalent to the results that you would have gotten had you studied the canonical system where the number of particles is strictly conserved. So, you see the difference between strictly conserved and conserved on an average as it is in the grand canonical uh, ensemble, these two approaches are nearly the same in the thermodynamic limit. So, because the fluctuations in the number of particles is in goes inversely as the square root of the size of the system. So, in, in situations where the size of the system is very large, you can sort of safely ignore these uh, differences. So, that is the reason why we actually allow for fluctuation in the number of particles. So, when you do that, you see you have to now force yourself to introduce a chemical potential. So, not only you are interested, so remember that beta is 1 by k t and I also told you that I do not like k there. So, I put 1 by t. So, in my notes it is all 1 by t. I am just putting k t 
because you know psychologically it's nice to think of KT as your I mean it's it's nice to remind yourself what I'm talking about. So T is temperature in energy units, whereas here T is temperature in Kelvin. So here T is temperature in energy units. But whatever it is, uh, beta is uh, one by uh, temperature in energy units, and mu is your chemical potential. Okay, and chemical potential is basically the energy required to uh, remove one particle from the system, or add or remove one particle in the system. So, uh, bottom line is that if you want to find the average of a system or average of any property of the system where that system is not only exchanging energy with surroundings, but it is also exchanging the number of particles. So, what Boltzmann would have you do is that uh, you are now compelled to multiply uh, by this weight. Namely, it is uh, so the trace remember is just the diagonal expectation value. So, if you take diagonal expectation value formally, it is just going to be this. So, these are the eigenvalues. So, I have just taken the diagonal expectation values and then I have multiplied it this way. So, now you might be wondering what is all this? You see, uh, this you will see is that uh, because uh, yeah, so this uh, this requires some effort to explain. The point is that uh, the Hamiltonian uh, it commutes with the number of particles. So you see that Hamiltonian commutes with the number of particles. The density commutes with the number of particles, but the annihilation operator clearly does not. So in fact, uh, and not only that, what is even more important is the annihilation operator does not even commute with the total number of particles, let alone the Hamiltonian. Okay, I, I invite you to actually insert this, uh, remember what this S was, what was S? S was this. So, if you insert this back into this formula and uh, you uh, work this out, you will see that you, you get back. Uh, so, this in effect is only this. Okay. So, you might be thinking why have I written it like this. In fact, uh, this, this whole thing is nothing but C of R T C dagger of R dash T dash that is what it is. But then uh, if I split this up into uh, C hat and S and S dagger, uh, you will find that because of the unitary nature of this, uh, this operator, most parts of this will cancel out except this part which will survive okay because this uh, this part of the s operator will not uh, commute with the annihilation operator so i understand that the the motivation for this is actually not very well given in these notes okay because uh, you know it, it's kind of very tedious to write all this uh, very explicitly so perhaps what we can do is that uh, we can have some kind of you know worked out assignment where I explain how to go from my original definition of Green's function and reach here so that this has to be well motivated. So, if you accept that that is a, a reasonable way of uh, defining the Green's function of the system, then you can go ahead and uh, ask yourself uh, what this Green's function looks like in the case of some, uh, you know, when you specialize to very some very simple cases, some simple situations. So, one of the simplest situation is when you turn off everything. When you turn off the uh, Coulomb interaction between particles, you turn off the source. So, in that case, you see uh, it is very clear uh, what that means. So, it is basically just this. So, you can uh, now uh, explicitly work this out. So, the idea is that you want to be able to work this out in practice. So, uh, so to work this out uh, explicitly, so what I have done is that I have decided to uh, because uh, you see if there is no Coulomb interaction, there is no, uh, so that means it is just free particles. So, free particles means momentum is a good quantum number. So, I might as well go and do the momentum representation where h bar k is the momentum. So, in that case uh, I can very simply rewrite all these Green's functions 
in terms of uh, the averages of this sort ok. So, I am going to be able to write it this way ok. It is uh, I mean I have to uh, admit that it can be very intimidating for somebody who has been uh, doing this for the first time because there is a lot of uh, unfamiliar algebra involved. But that is the reason why uh, these lectures are merely meant uh, as a kind of uh, you know it is meant to show you the path basically it is meant to indicate uh, in which direction you should proceed in order to learn this subject. So, it is not a substitute for self learning it is not also a substitute for uh, actually doing the assignment. So, and uh, I have to also make sure that I you know assign enough problems to uh, fill all the gaps that are there in these notes ok that is something I intend doing in the next couple of classes. So, I am going to actually fill these gaps in the form of assignments. So, which we can then uh, solve explicitly, but bottom line is that uh, you see because it is a translationally this situation corresponds to a free particle it is clear that uh, it is going to be extremely convenient to uh, work in momentum space and when you do that uh, you end up with this sort of a Green's function ok. So, the Green's function that you will consider uh, basically involves the Fermi Dirac and the Bose Einstein uh, sort of uh, distributions. So, clearly that is what that is. So, if if I am uh, talking about uh, the um, Fermi Dirac distribution if the sigma will be minus 1 if it is Bose Einstein is sigma is plus 1. So, just like you have whole and particle Green's function here also you have whole particle Green's functions uh, and so on and so forth. So, these are uh, these are the traditional whole and particle Green's function, but the uh, interesting point is that uh, you see one one very important um, feature. Uh, so, these are by the way called Matsubara Green's function because they are Green's functions the of a system that is uh, coupled to the environment and it is exchanging energy with the environment and coming to an equilibrium. So, that is the reason why it is called a Matsubara Green's function and these Matsubara Green's functions have some very interesting and important uh, property and that is that they uh, are uh, they obey a kind of periodicity in imaginary time. So, that means, if you assume that the times that you are considering. Uh, so, if you analytically continue to a situation where the times are on the imaginary axis ok. In fact, this time ordering that we can see remember that I use this symbol time ordering. So, in fact, in this particular example this time ordering has a specific meaning it is only within uh, in the imaginary time. So, I have to assume that the times are all uh, between 0 and minus i beta h. So, then only this time ordering makes sense. So, t greater than t prime means t is closer to minus i beta h than t prime. So, in other words all my times are here this is minus i beta h and 0. So, these are my times. So, uh, if I assume that all my times are imaginary, so you might be thinking why are we doing that that seems completely bizarre you might think I have gone crazy, but actually it is not because you will see that it, this mathematical device of uh, working in imaginary time allows for very elegant solutions for these Green's functions which you can then continue back to real time later on. So, in imaginary time the Green's function the time ordered Green's function along the imaginary axis actually obeys this sort of a boundary condition and this is called the Kubo Martin Schwinger boundary condition. So, the idea is that uh, because of this you can actually uh, show that the these Green's functions uh, are expressible. Uh, in terms of uh, these discrete frequencies. So, because uh, there is periodicity in, in the time domain you can see the corresponding frequencies uh, become discrete 
and the discrete uh, frequencies uh, depend on whether it is bosons or fermions. For bosons the discrete frequency are 2 pi n divided by beta h bar uh, that means uh, even integer into pi y beta h bar or if it is fermion is odd integer into pi y h bar. Okay. So, that is the reason why these are basically called bosonic and fermionic Matsubara frequencies. All right. So, the point is that these Green's functions also obey this sort of an equation which uh, then means that the definition that we introduced using many body physics consideration which involves the time ordering and uh, you know grand canonical statistical mechanical averaging and so on. It also obeys an equation which a mathematician would also uh, recognize as that of a Green's function. So, remember that Green was a mathematician and he had no knowledge of uh, this sort of physics and he studied Green's functions for his own reasons and mathematicians have been studying Green's functions for ages for their own reasons. And it is nice to know that the Green's functions, see we had no business of calling some bizarre definition like this a Green's function because already Green's function has a well defined meaning in mathematics. So, at the outset uh, you should have objected. So, I cannot randomly call some crazy definition like this a Green's function. So, the reason why in hindsight it was not a bad idea is because see if you write down the equation obeyed by that function, it indeed is the equation obeyed by a Green's function as mathematicians would recognize it. So, that means it uh, deserves to be called a Green's function because in some sense it is a Green's function. All right. So, what I am going to do is that uh, given the fact that uh, it is going to be very hard for you to um, swallow what I am saying without going through all these steps on your own. I think I should allow you to spend some time uh, working through all the steps and if you cannot understand anything in between and I am sure there are many uh, points in my notes where you would probably have trouble understanding because this is a kind of a difficult subject and it is impossible for any author to put everything down explicitly. Well, that would make the book almost unreadable as it is it is pretty hard to read. So, um, so this it is the nature of the subject itself. So, it is uh, not anybody's fault it is how the subject is. So, you have to put in effort and try to understand all these uh, ideas and uh, I will try my best to remedy the situation through assignments. So, I will uh, work out many uh, intermediate steps and post uh, videos just like I posted that video on the rubber band solution of the rubber band problem. Similarly, I can start posting videos about uh, solving some you know some intermediate uh, some theorem proving of this Matsubara of Green's function and so on. So, that might uh, fix some issues, uh, but the remaining issues you have to fix on your own ok. So, sorry this is this is a 3 dimensional Dirac delta ok. So, the remaining you have to fix on your own. So, I am going to stop here now and uh, before the next class I uh, will see if I can uh, uh, provide some of those missing steps in all these proofs. So, but in the meanwhile please make an effort to seriously work out all these steps and see if you are understanding. But uh, even if you do not understand something you just assume that is true and proceed and see if you can understand the remaining things. So, you just make a note in the margin that you have not understood that step, but then provisionally you assume you have understood it and proceed further and see if uh, you can then come back and uh, you know understand why that has to be also correct. But if you do not follow certain things uh, which uh, you know those margin uh, question marks still remain at the end you can of course, uh, you should of course, always ask me through email and all that ok. So, I am going to stop here now and uh, in the next class uh, we will continue this discussion, but uh, uh, 
perhaps uh, you know after taking the uh, appropriate steps to ensure that uh, the derivations are all clarified thank you mm -hmm.